Amen. You guys sound good this morning. I wasn't sure what to expect. Expect God. Amen. Expect God. That's good. Well, I'm glad that each of you made your way out today, and we have quite a few of our folks watching online, and we want to thank you guys for joining us online and being a part of the service this morning, not wanting to miss, and, and I'm, I'm excited about what the Lord's doing in our church. I've been praying about what the Lord's doing in our country and all the things that are happening around the world. There's a lot happening right now, and things I never thought I would see. I, I never could have imagined a few weeks ago us having to say, well, We'll probably have more people watch online than we will in the building because of a virus going around. I mean, who would have thought that? But God is faithful, and he's in control, and he's the great physician, and he can take care of us no matter where we are. So I'm thankful for each of you being here. Yeah. I'm thankful for those that are watching again online. We want to welcome you from your couch. And some of us are a little jealous right now, but... <laughs> Or your bed. <laughs> well, before we get started this morning, we have a couple things we want to celebrate. We always like to celebrate decisions and things that are happening in the church. And last week, we had three adults who trusted Christ in the morning service. And that is awesome. Yes, that is awesome. We also had several more sign up for our membership class. And we had two turn in their membership paperwork last week. So we had two more that joined the church. That's exciting. We'll... Uh, Announce that next week and go over that. I don't, think that. I don't think they're here, so that's okay. We'll do it next week when they're here. Those of you that are watching online, if you wouldn't mind just commenting so we can say hi to you back. We'll know that you're there and we can uh, keep our community going together and be apart. Feel like we're all together even though we're kind of separated out all over the place. Um, today, though, we're continuing in our series on Elijah. And I, I'll be honest with you, I've had a lot of trouble with this. It seemed like everything in the world tried to get in the way of me giving and getting this message on paper and getting it down and, and then even being here today with everything that's going on. But it just seems like the devil has fought so hard this week. And I, I don't know why he's doing that, but that's okay. We're going to go ahead with it anyways. But in this story we're coming to in Elijah, we have looked at him and his being in one of our Old Testament prophets that we see and we've seen uh, the wicked king Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who was even worse than him, bring idolatry, the worship of this false god of Baal into the nation of Israel. And this false god of Baal was a Phoenician storm god or a fertility god who they believed would bring uh, rain and storms and bountiful crops. And then it's kind of funny, we saw how God's man stood up and says, well, it's not even going to rain and just put that false god in his place. We saw Jezebel's plan to exterminate all of those who worship the true God and how she was trying to bring everyone into worshiping this false God of Baal in the nation of Israel. We talked about how God prepared Elijah for the job that he had him to do. We saw God call his people back to a national revival. We looked at Elijah when he stood on the top of Mount Carmel being right next to the Mediterranean Sea and having this fire fight, so to speak, with the false prophets of Baal. We watched God answer with fire from a very short prayer. We saw how God took care of Elijah through all of these things, fed him by the brook, took care of him. While, uh, and every step of the way, God was taking care of and preparing this prophet Elijah to do a job that he had for him. But today we're going to look at a little bit of a different part of Elijah's life. We've seen Elijah pray in each one of our weeks that we've talked about his life. Uh, he prayed humbly last week and specifically and persistently and expectantly, and God answered we saw Elijah fall in prayer over a dead boy. We saw the fire fall from heaven after his prayer. We even saw the rain fall after Elijah prayed last week. But today we're going to see a different kind of a falling, and that is Elijah's spirit falling. We're going to talk about something that is probably not talked about too much in too many churches today, and that's depression and how real it is and how bad it can hurt and how tough it is to go through it, and how most of the times, we as Christians, we suffer in silence in this area. 
We pick up our story in 1 Kings chapter 19, but before we start, I want us to pray together, and then we'll start reading our story in 1 Kings 19. Lord, we know that you control everything, that you are all-powerful. We know that everything that's going on in our world right now is under your control. You haven't forgotten about us. You haven't turned your back on us. You haven't uh, abandoned us, but you've allowed this, Lord. Help us as your people to stay true to you even in difficult times when, when even loved ones around us cannot feel well and be going through us this kind of sickness that we're dealing with. But Lord, I pray that you would help us now to take those thoughts and all the things that have been going through our mind for the last few days and put them aside so that we can see what your word has for us and the reason that you have us here this morning, knowing that each one of us in this building and those watching online are, are here for a purpose. And you have a reason for us watching and listening to your word today. So would you show us what that is? Help us to draw closer to you because of being here today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse number 1 says, When Ahab got home, this is, remember, he's just come back. So he, when Ahab got home, remember, the, the, the floods are getting ready to come. Elijah has just prayed. Rain is about to come. He runs down and tells Ahab, you better get home quick or you're not going to make it. So, and then Elijah runs off, and Ahab, now, verse 1, gets home. He told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So this whipped king, and I mean whooped like, not like he was beat by Elijah, I mean whipped like he's whipped at home, right? You, you men, you, you, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Don't pretend. I heard that there's only two kinds of men in this world, whipped and liars, so we're going to go on and leave that alone. But this whipped King Ahab comes home and tells his wife on Elijah, oh, Honey, you're never going to believe what this man did to me and did what to your prophets. You'll never believe it. So verse 2, Jezebel sent the, messengers, the message to Elijah, May the gods strike me and even kill me by this time tomorrow if I have not killed you just as you killed them. So this wicked king sends word to Elijah that she's after his life. Verse 3. Elijah was afraid. Well, sure. He's afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, which is about 90 to 100 miles away, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Now, hold on just a minute. Isn't this the same guy who just went up on top of a mountain and challenged 450 prophets of Baal to a firefight? Took a stand in front of 450 dudes. Isn't, is this the same guy who has just, I mean, uh, called down fire from heaven? Isn't this the same guy who, who has prayed and God has answered in huge ways where he stood in front of this King Ahab before and, and basically told him what's going to happen and put him in his place? But now we see him afraid of one woman. Now, I guess there are some women who could be as bad as 450 men. I think I might know who some of them are. But this woman did command an army. But this man, who every time he has prayed, God has answered in miraculous ways, is now scared for his life. Verse 4. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. Man, this guy has just done huge things, miracles like we've never seen. Experience God answer in ways that are just unbelievable. And now he sits down and he's praying to die. And I think God has a sense of humor because if you know the story of Elijah, you know that he's one of two men who never did die. The verse goes on. I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Elijah goes from praying with power to praying for death. He's so scared and depressed that he just wants to die. He wants it to be over. Have you ever been there? I'm going to ask you to be real honest with yourself this morning. I'm not asking you to raise your hand and identify yourself to other people that are around you, but inside your own heart, I want you to answer the question for yourself. Have you ever been that depressed I know most people don't like to really talk honestly about this kind of stuff in church and it's a little uncomfortable 
but have you ever been there? I'm going to be real transparent with you this morning. I have. I've been at that point in my life. Where I'm just, I can relate to what he's saying. I've had depression and anxiety build up in me so strong that I've prayed the same thing that Elijah has. God, just let this be done. I'm done. Just go ahead and kill me now. I can't handle it anymore. I need some relief. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt that way? Verse 5. Then he, that's Elijah, laid down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. You know, Elijah may have given up on himself, but God hadn't given up on Elijah yet. Look at verse 6. He looked around there, and beside his head was some, baked, or some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and laid down again. God's still meeting his needs just like he did at the brook, just like he did with the widow woman. God is still meeting his needs even though he wants to die. Look at verse 7. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, which is an almost 200-mile trip that should have taken him about 10 to 14 days, but it took Elijah almost 40 days to make this journey. And God provided for his food, God provided for his water yet again. He gave him enough to get him where he needed to go. Verse 9, And he came to the cave where he spent the night, but the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Can you hear the depression, the the down-spirited place that Elijah is at right now? He says, God, I have done what's right. I have zealously served you, but the people. I have, but they haven't. And they've killed everybody, and I'm the only one. He feels like he's all alone. He feels like the whole world is against him. He felt like nobody cared. He felt like just giving up. Verse 11. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain, and it was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. And the wind, after the wind, was the earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? I mean, this guy, Elijah, has seen God do huge miracles, answer by fire. I mean, big league stuff. Now he's feeling a mighty storm. He's feeling an earthquake. But God wasn't speaking to him in the storm and in the earthquake and in the fire this time. God was speaking to him in a still, small voice that said to him what are you doing here Elijah and that's the same question God asks him in verse 9 so Elijah repeats the same answer that he gives God back then and he says this in verse 14 he replied again just in case you didn't hear me God I'm adding that part in there I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. God, in case you didn't hear me, let me tell you again. They killed every other person who serves you. I'm the last one in the whole world. Verse 15. Then the Lord told him, Go back the same way you came, and travel the wilderness of Damascus. It's about 150 miles. And when you arrive there... Anoint Hazel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Menola, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve, or what that's saying there is, I have reserved for myself, is the way this reads. 7,000 others in Israel who have not bowed down to Baal or kissed him. 
Elijah, what God is telling you is I am not done with you yet. And you are not alone. I've got all of this under control. There is still a job for you to do. And Elijah, you are invincible until I am done with you. Elijah just had a great victory. He watched fire drop straight out of heaven at a prayer. God sent rain to an area that had been in famine for three and a half years at a simple prayer that Elijah prayed. He's had all these incredible experiences. And whenever we have a spiritual win, you can be sure Satan is going to be coming and we're going to be tired. Have you ever been tired? Have you ever been through something, uh, whether it's working for something at church or maybe it's something spiritual in your life or, or maybe it's just a time where you have had a, a battle in life and you're just tired? Have you ever been there? It's when we are tired that we become vulnerable. And when we get tired, Satan loves to attack. And many times that's when he tries to bring in depression into our lives. We have almost a perfect list in this reading here of how to get depressed. It's almost a formula that's given to us. If you'll do this, you can be depressed too. And the first one, you ready for it? I think you got them on the back. Yep, you got them on the back of your bulletin. You can follow along in the church app if you want to write them down. The first one is this. Elijah's worn out and tired. He's worn out and he's tired. Just think of what he's been through. He has just watched God answer with fire from heaven. He takes all of the false prophets and kills them. Then he goes up, climbs up to the top of the mountain, gets down on his knees and starts praying for God to send rain. And when God finally does, he runs down the mountain in front of Ahab and tells him, you better get home quick or you're not going to make it. And now he's running for his life because he gets word that Jezebel is after him. This dude is tired. He's experienced a lot. He's been through a lot. He's tired. Second thing is this. Not, was, not only was he just tired, but Elijah shut people out and went off by himself. Elijah shut people out and went off by himself. Verse 3 of 1 Kings 19 says that Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He takes off by himself. He goes to Beersheba, a town in Jerusalem, or in Judah, and left his servant there. Now he's completely alone. No one else around him. And depression begins to set in. Write this one down. Elijah began to focus on the negative. Elijah began to focus on the negative. Verse 9 says, He came to the cave and spent the night, but the Lord said to him, What are you doing here? And Elijah said, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, God. They tore down your altars. They killed every one of your prophets, and I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. He says the same thing down in verse 13. When Elijah heard the small voice, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And the voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets, and I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Like, God, you didn't hear me before, but let me tell you what is wrong with your people. Let me tell you what's wrong with your country. Let me tell you what's wrong with everybody else. They broke their deal with you. They don't want anything to do with you. They tore down the altar. They're, they're not worshiping you anymore, God. They, they've turned their back completely on you. They want nothing to do with you anymore, God. I'm the only one in my whole country, in this whole world that's left who wants to serve you, wants to do anything from you. It's just me. I'm the only one. How am I going to do anything, God? How can I influence anybody when I'm the only one left? Have you ever felt like that? That's where he's at. Focusing on the negative. Write this one down. Elijah began to forget what God had done. When he focused on the negative, guess what he forgot? The positive. He forgot what God had done. If God can feed him by a bunch of birds next to a river, if God can feed him with unlimited flour and oil for over two years with a little widow woman, if God can use him to bring a boy back to life, 
If God can drop fire straight out of heaven at a prayer, if God can bring rain back to a country after three and a half years of drought and famine, don't you think God could take care of him now? All that he's facing is one mad woman who wants him dead. And if you're a man, you have been there. Especially if you are married. For more than five minutes. But all he sees is the negative. <laughs> it's Elijah's all-powerful God just going to turn his back on him now? And you see, when Elijah's eyes got off of God and began to focus on himself, the depression began to set in. Because it was all about him. And it can happen to us today. And it does happen to us every day. God, really? Don't you know what people are saying about me, God? Don't you care anymore? Don't you know that my spouse is not treating me like they should? Don't you know that I'm sick, Lord? I don't feel well. Don't you know that my marriage is a wreck? Don't you know, God, that I'm about to have to file bankruptcy because of all this? I feel like I'm the only one facing any one of these problems. Every time I take one step forward, it feels like, God, I'm taking three steps back. And it looks like and sounds like everybody at church has got just a perfect life because they come in smiling and happy and they just look like they got it all together and they're not hurting for anything and nothing bad ever happens to them. And then I walk in and feel like, God, it's just me. Nobody else has to face this stuff but me. It's all, why? Why is it just me? Why does, why do you, where have you been? I'm all alone. Nobody cares. No one would even know or care if I, if, if I if took my own life. No one would even miss me. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been at that point? Be honest. Be honest with yourself. I remember a day just as clear as I'm standing here where I felt the same way. I remember the circumstances like it just happened to me yesterday. I had to change my cell phone number because of death threats that were coming on. There was a man who actually made an attempt on my life. And when that happened, I will never forget the, the small town that we lived in. I drove around the back of Walmart because it's the only thing in town and Walmarts are everywhere. And I pull in the back of the Walmart and turn the engine off and I just sat there. And I experienced my first panic attack. Have you ever had one of those? It scared me to death. I sat in that car and thought, you know, the world would be so much better if I wasn't in it. My wife and kids, they'd be way better off if I wasn't here. Then I started to sit there and think about how I could make that happen. I told you, we don't talk about this kind of stuff in church, but we ought to. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever been there? I almost broke down in my office this week thinking about it again. Almost had another panic attack, and it's been years since this happened. But I was at that point in my life where I thought... I can't go through this anymore. I almost talked myself out of sharing this with you today. But that's where Elijah was. And you might be at that same spot in your life right now. We're all good at hiding things. We walk into church like we got it all together. Smile. Hold our wife's hand. Our kids are all following us just in a little row, all tallest to smallest. And we smile for everybody. How you doing? Oh, I'm blessed. I'm so good. How you doing? We lie through our teeth because we just finished screaming at each other in the car. Kids are getting ready and we're throwing stuff all over the place and yelling at each other like it's World War III and yelling at the kids and grounding them for a million years and the Xbox is getting smashed and, and you know, that's just what happened to me this morning. No, my wife and I finally figured out how to never fight on the way to church. We don't drive together. <laughs> but we're real good at putting on this nice front. We got our nice clothes. We act like we got it all together. And we walk into church and people smile. And we put on this phony, fake facade where we just hide who we really are and what we're really going through. 
Elijah. He was done. I don't want to do this anymore. And God knew exactly how to answer Elijah's depression, just like he still knows how to help us today. And I want us to look at how God answered Elijah's situation for the rest of our time this morning. Verse 5 says, Then he laid down and slept. This is Elijah under the broom tree. And as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. And he looked around there, and beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. And the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. How did God help Elijah through this problem? How did God help Elijah get through the depression that he's in? Well, the first thing God did was tell Elijah to eat and rest. And that's on the back of your bulletin as well. Eat and rest. My dad used to say all the time, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. When we're tired, we're weak. I don't know about you, but when I get tired, I get grouchy. And when I get hungry, I get hangry. So sometimes the most spiritual thing I can do, eat a snack and sit down and rest. And sometimes that's, that's the best advice that some of us can ever get. When we're at our weakest point, Satan loves to attack us when we're tired and when we're hungry. Luke chapter 4 tells us about Jesus when he was there. It says in verse 1, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the Scripture says people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it to you if you will worship me. And Jesus said, The Scripture says, You must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, the highest point of the temple, and said, If you're the Son of God, jump off. For the Scripture says he will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And Jesus responded, The Scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. And when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. You see, Jesus was weak and Jesus was tired after 40 days of fasting. And if the devil thought he could get Jesus when he was weak and tired, what do you think he thinks about us? When I'm weak and when I'm tired and when I'm hungry, I'm at some of my most vulnerable points for Satan to come after me. So many times in my life I've been tempted when I was at that point, tired and hungry. And our enemy is looking for us to be in a weakened state to try to get us to fall. Sometimes, again, the most spiritual thing we can do is just get some rest and eat something. Verse 9, then he came to a cave, talking about Elijah again, where he spent the night, but the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you and torn down the altars and killed every one of your prophets. And I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Verse 11 or 13, he gets the same question asked to him, what are you doing here? And in verse 14, he gives the same response of what the people did and how I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. He gives it twice. And the second thing I want us to look at is not only did, was, did God tell Elijah basically to eat and to get some rest, the second thing God did was replace lies with truth. God replaced lies with truth. Can I ask you, was Elijah the only one left? No. He might have felt that way. He might have felt like everybody else had turned their back and everybody else had died, and he's the only one, but it wasn't true. And sometimes we can get a feeling, and it can take the, take the place of truth in our life. The enemy likes to get us off and alone and make us feel like we're all alone, but we're never alone. 1 Kings 19, 18 says, Yet I will preserve, or God's telling Elijah, I have reserved for myself 7, 
7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed the knee or kissed him. 7,000. Elijah, I'm all alone. Dude, you got 7,000 people back there waiting for you. That's not even close to being alone. But even without the 7,000, Elijah, guess what? You were never alone even without everybody else. Because we're never alone. Romans chapter 11 says this in verse 1, I ask, then God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel. Of course not. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. No, God has not rejected his own people, whom he chose from the very beginning. Do you realize that the scripture says about this? Elijah the prophet complained to God about how the people of Israel, uh, what they said. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And do you remember God's reply? He said, no, I have 7,000 others who have never bowed the knee to Baal. And the same today, for a few of people of Israel have remained faithful because of God's grace, his undeserved kindness in choosing them. And since it is through God's kindness, then it is not by their good works. For in that case, God's grace would not be what it really is, free and undeserved. God always promises that there will be a remnant, a group of people that will be faithful to him all the way to the end. And we can know that we are never going to be alone here on this earth, that there are always other people who believe what we believe, who are trying to take a stand for what we try to take a stand for and try to follow Jesus Christ here while we live on this earth. God always has people. But even without them, Matthew chapter 28 says this, be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Even when we are all alone, we're not really all alone. Because he's promised that he'd never leave us, and he'd never forsake us. He's promised that he would be that friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's that loving, heavenly father who cares for us and wants to wrap his arms around us and tell us, you are not alone, I care for you, I am with you. We are never alone. Yes. Verse 11, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. And it was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. The first thing God did was tell Elijah to eat and rest. The second thing God did was replace the lies of being alone with the truth. It will never be alone. And the third thing that God did was speak in a still, small voice. Up to this point, God's been speaking pretty loud to Elijah. He's been loud and he's been obvious. Raising a boy from the dead. That's pretty big. That's not something you can keep quiet. Calling down fire from heaven, you can't hide that. That's a pretty big deal. Praying down rain after they've seen no rain for three and a half years, that's pretty obvious. That's a big deal. But God doesn't always do things in a big and a public way. Sometimes he answers with fire from heaven, and sometimes God answers with a still, small voice. And when he speaks in that still, small voice many times, it's to get our attention. Being quiet can be just as effective as being loud sometimes. I think I even just woke PJ up. <laughs> sometimes when you get quiet, if you're a teacher, you know sometimes that gets attention because people look up because oh, well, what's some, something's happening. You have to stop what you're doing and focus on what's being said. And our focus must shift to God when we are struggling in these times of depression. Because depression always comes when we are primarily focused on ourselves. It's real, real hard to be depressed when you're focused on God. Verse 15. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be king of Aram, and anoint Jehu, the grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat. He's going to replace Elijah as the prophet here, and we're going to look at that 
story next week when he replaces him. But to finish up this morning, the first thing God did was tell Elijah to eat and to rest. The second thing he did was to replace the lies with the truth. The third thing God did was speak in a still, small voice. And the last thing, the fourth thing that God did was give Elijah a job to do. God gave Elijah a job to do. Again, depression, suicidal thoughts come when we're focused solely on ourselves. God wants, once again, to shift Elijah's focus from himself to others, to something else, to a job that he wants him to complete. Elijah's being told by God that he's not done with him yet. There's still a job for you to do, Elijah. There's still more for you to do. You may feel like you're the only one. You may feel like you want to die. You may feel like you don't want any part of this, but I'm not done with you, so you need to get up and get going. I have something for you to do. And I want to encourage you here with this today, especially if you're struggling with this depression or the even suicidal thoughts that can so easily invade even a Christian's mind. Don't believe the lie that Satan will fill your mind with. You are not alone. You are loved by God and you're loved by us, your church family. Get some rest. Eat some food. Focus on God and His Word. Listen to what God is telling you and not the enemy. There is more for you to do. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. There's a God who loves you and cares for you more than you could ever imagine. And there are people who care about you and want to be there for you. Don't quit. Don't give in. Don't follow through with those thoughts that are in your mind because those are lies from Satan and God is trying to replace them with some truth in your mind this morning. Some of you just may need to talk to somebody. That's what I did. I called a friend. Talk to a godly person who can step into your life and help you and show you how important you are to God and how important you are to your family. If you don't have anybody to talk or text, put the next one up there. That's my cell phone number. You can call me or text me. Now, if you start talking about gibberish, I'm going to hang up on you because I got better stuff to do than talk about whatever, okay? But if you're struggling, I'll talk with you. I'd be happy to. Because I've been there. I've experienced it for myself, and I know. In the first week, God made Elijah. In the second week, while we were studying his life, God used Elijah. In the third week, God answered Elijah. And now we see God encouraging Elijah. And God wants to do the same thing for us today. God wants to do the same thing for you today. He doesn't want you to stay depressed, to live in that kind of a state, to, to be all focused on yourself and how bad things are, believing the lies that Satan has for you because God is not a liar. He is truth, and he wants to invade us with truth so that there's no room for those lies. Get in God's Word. Read God's Word. Talk to somebody you can trust, a godly person, not just some peer that you work with who's going to tell you, yeah, that's a good job. Go ahead and run your car into a tree. Don't, don't let's talk to people like that. Talk, call somebody who's godly and loves you and cares about you. Can I tell you, look around the room. I know we got a bunch of people out, but there's still a bunch of people in here. Look around. The people that you're looking at right now, they love you too. And they care about you. And they do anything in the world to help you. If you don't have their phone number, walk up to them and ask them. If they don't give it to you, come tell me. I'll give it to you. I got all their phone numbers. I'll give everybody Mike Huseman's cell phone number. <laughs> but God loves us. He cares for us. He does not want to see us in that kind of a life. He doesn't want to see us focused on depression. Sometimes the most spiritual thing we can do is just get some rest and eat a meal. Or it may be that God's wanting to replace the lies with the truth in your life today. The third thing God did here for Elijah was speak in a still, small voice to get his attention. And then God told Elijah that he had a job for him to do. It wasn't time to quit yet. As long as there's life, there's hope. As long as there's breath, there's a job to do. Don't give up. Don't quit. God loves you. And so do we. Would you pray with me?
Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the story of Elijah and how you just lay it out here so that we can see that you even said that Elijah was a person like us. He's just a regular fella. And Lord, sometimes we struggle with these things. Sometimes we struggle with depression. Sometimes we struggle with wanting to just end it all and get out and to be done so we don't have to fight the fight anymore. We don't have to live that way. But Lord, we know that you care. And you want to replace those lies that have been spoken into us with the truth of your word. You want us to know that you're not done with us. You want to get our attention and to tell us that there's still a job to do. So Father, help us. Help us to see we're not alone. And we are loved. Especially, especially by you. With our heads bowed and eyes closed. You may be here this morning struggling with this. You might be struggling with the, the, the depression coming in your life. And even suicidal thoughts at times. Can I tell you God loves you? I love you. And God's not done with you yet. There's still a job for you to do. He cares for you. And he wants to replace all those lies in your life with the truth of his word. And he may be speaking to you in that still small voice this morning. Trying to get your attention to tell you, I still have a job for you to do. I still have something that only you can do. And now the choice is yours. Will you believe the truth of God and reject the lies of the enemy? Will you get quiet enough to listen to the still, small voice that he's trying to speak to you with? We don't like quietness. We always got the radio going or the TV on or something going for noise. But sometimes we need to just be quiet and allow God to speak to us. And can I tell you, he's still got a job for you because you're still here. He cares, He loves you, and He has a job for you today. So would you get some help? Don't suffer in silence. Don't keep it to yourself. That's one of the lies, that no one will understand what I'm going through. That's a lie. Don't believe it. Odds are you walk up to somebody in this room or talk to somebody who's a a godly person and you say, you know what, this is what I'm struggling with. You know what, there's a good chance they're going to look at you and say, you know what, I've been there. I've struggled with it too. And you're going to find that you're not alone. Would you talk to somebody? And if you don't have anybody to talk to, call me. I'll talk to you. I'd be happy to. Because I've been real honest this morning told you I, I struggled with it. And I can share my story with you in more detail. But would you get help? You might be here this morning and not even be a believer. You've never become a Christian. You're not for sure that if something happened to you on your way home from church this morning, you're not sure that you would go to heaven. You may be sitting on your couch watching online this morning and not know for sure that heaven's going to be your home one day. Can I tell you, you can know that for sure? The Bible's very simple. It tells us there's just a couple simple things we need to know. The first one is we need to understand we're all sinners. Every single one of us have broken God's standard of righteousness. We have sinned. And because we sin, there's a penalty for that sin. The penalty is death. The Bible says the wages, the penalty of sin is death. And that death is not just a physical death here on this earth, but it's a spiritual death where we're separated from God in a terrible place called hell. But the Bible goes on and says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a gift. Eternal life, salvation, spending eternity with God in heaven, that is a gift. A relationship with Jesus is a gift that God is offering to you even today. And all you have to do is receive it. The Bible says, for whosoever, that's anybody, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You've got to call on him, understanding that you're a sinner, understanding the penalty for sin, understanding that Jesus Christ died on a cross, paid the penalty for you. And all you have to do is accept that and ask him for that gift, and he will give it to you. 
And if you've never done that before, but you'd like to do it today, you can do it today. Whether you're sitting here in this auditorium today, or if you're sitting on your couch, or sitting on your bed, or wherever you're at. You can come before God and ask Him for that gift, and He has promised He'll give it to you. So right where you're at, no matter whether you're seated in here or you're watching at home or wherever you're at, would you just pray with me? In your own heart, not out loud, but pray with me in your heart. And God has promised to hear that prayer and to receive you as one of His own kids. If you've never asked Christ to give you that free gift, but you'd like to do it this morning, just pray with me. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and nobody's looking around. Would you just pray with me? Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I deserve to go to hell because of my sin. Thank you for dying on that cross and paying the penalty for my sins. And the best way I know how, I accept your free gift of salvation. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray.